From the nation's capital, the Conservative Caucus presents Conservative Roundtable, an in-depth look at today's most important issues. Welcome to Conservative Roundtable. I'm Howard Phillips, Chairman of the Conservative Caucus, which sponsors these broadcasts. We're privileged to have as our guest for this broadcast a man whom I've known for a number of years, a man of extraordinary accomplishment. He's got incredible experiences and achievements in his still young life. Stephen Allen has a law degree. He has a Ph.D. in biodefense. Uh, he went to Cumberland Law School. He has an M.A. in political science, a B.A. in political science. He's been a writer and editor. Uh, he helped run a major direct mail company. Uh, he's participated in the writing of books. He's been a speech writer and speech deliverer. Uh, he has been uh, on the inside of many key events. He's been a candidate for lieutenant governor of his native state of uh, Alabama. And yet, despite all of these achievements, all of these accomplishments, He's now, and I've listed just a fraction of them, he's now in the cartoon business. <laughs> tell, tell us how you got there, Steve. Well, you know. And tell us what it is. Well, uh, the, the, the comic is uh, The Gentleman from Lick Skillet, and it's the story of a, uh, a congressman from the mythical 8th Congressional District of Alabama. There are uh, only seven. Uh, normally, there are actually seven, so we made up an eighth. Wait for the seven, see what Acorn does. Yeah, that's right, that's right. And we, um, and we talk about Acorn in the strip, by the way. And, uh, but this, the, uh, the district is uh, roughly northeast Alabama, and that's an area that I, I grew up in. I was a newspaper reporter, radio news director in that area. You've been a talk show host a as well. A talk show host. And uh, so I, uh, I based, uh, based it largely on, uh, on my experiences. You know, you write what you know about. So the, the, the character here, his, his home life and his district is uh, where I, I come from. And uh, Lick Skillet uh, was actually the original name of uh, my hometown. I'm from Anniston in Oxford, Alabama, and Oxford's original name was, uh, was Lick Skillet. And, uh, and what does that mean? It's, uh, <laughs> it's a common name, and I, it just basically seems to mean, uh, you know, place that uh, you uh, get good food or something like that. You want to lick the skillet, uh, as best we can tell, because the name does crop up around the country in various places. Uh, and in fact, uh, then when I was a newspaper reporter in Fort Payne, which is also in the, the northeastern uh, part of the state, uh, where the Alabama band is from, if you uh, if you're familiar with country music, and uh, uh, they were actually at the local band when I started uh, working as a newspaper reporter there, and uh, there's a little community there. Uh, so so basically, Lickskill is a combination of of the towns that I've lived in, and uh, then this fellow uh, gets elected to Congress. And he's uh, sort of an idealized character, the kind of congressman that I wish we had. Uh, and that makes him a target. Uh, he has a family that's part of the strip, uh, people he knows, his staff people, people back home. And they just sort of all interplay. And it's, it's in the genre of, um, of something like Doonesbury. And that's what makes it, I think, unusual. Doonesbury is the cartoon uh, which is uh, of the left. Right. And uh, <laughs> what, what is the name of the fellow who does that? Uh, Gary Trudeau. Gary Trudeau. He's married to Jane Pauley. Jane Pauley. That's famous, right. They were introduced uh, broad, by Tom Brokaw. Famous broadcaster, <laughs> another lefty, Mr. Brokaw. Uh, and uh, as you say, Dunesbury's had a big impact. Much of Dunesbury was based on uh, Trudeau's experiences at Yale. Right. Started out, in fact, as a comic strip in the Yale yeah. paper. And... Um, and you know we all write about what we know, mm -hmm. and you know Alabama. Yeah, and and national politics, and we have, uh, uh, so you know we 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 wanted a, uh, something that was a, um, a, a sort of a response to Doonesbury. I mean, it's not a takeoff. It's not uh, trying to do uh, necessarily our own version specifically, other than the genre, which is um, we try to tell a story, often broken up into story arcs that run Monday through Saturday. Uh, and then uh, each strip has a little kicker, punchline, or ironic point. Uh, but we try to draw the reader back. Most of the humor is based on the characters, so it helps if you follow it on a regular basis because then you know who the characters are. You know why a particular line is funny. You might not otherwise. So it's not what they call a gag-a-day strip, which is most comic strips where they're just trying to make you laugh every day, but there's no really continuing plot line. Right. Uh, our plot lines are everything from... Uh, uh, the federal government taking over baseball and trying to run baseball to uh, we recently had a, a, a couple of weeks on the uh, 
the convention of a gr group we call Kernel, which is, uh, uh, some people have said is similar to ACORN, uh, which mainly is in, in the business of stealing elections and, and uh, creating imaginary people for the census and, uh, and, and intimidating politicians and businessmen and things like that. I know you've just gotten started. <laughs> is your strip uh, being published in any significant way? Uh, we're in a few papers, just little weeklies <clears throat> around, the, around the country. Uh, it's, it's mainly a web presence. Uh, it's licensed, the web rights are licensed to conservativehq.com, Richard Vigory's website. So it's very easy to find there. And then what we're trying to do is we're sort of using that as a basis to, uh, we're, we get paid for that. Uh, that pays for producing the strip, and now we're trying to get in papers around yeah. the country. I'm a big fan of Bruce Tinsley mm -hmm. and his cartoon series, Ballard Fillmore. Uh, you've sort of hinted at the difference, but please explain what distinguishes uh, your strip from the Ballard Fillmore strip. Right. His is <clears throat> mostly, it's, it's, it's sort of an editorial cartoon uh, approach. In other words, it's an issue... And he'll have Mallard or one of the other characters uh, comment on an issue. Maybe he'll have a liberal character who'll, you know, make some uh, counter comment. And uh, but it's not really they don't really have continuing plot lines. There are a few plot lines, but but mainly it's just uh, it's it's making his editorial statement, and that's fine. Yeah. Uh, absolutely no criticism. Two of the great ones whom I I knew personally when I was a college undergraduate mm -hmm. were Walt Kelly, mm -hmm. who did Pogo, and Al Cap, who did Little Abner. Right. Both of them moved to the right as time went on, especially Al Cap. When I was a Harvard freshman, I visited Al Cap at his studio in Boston, mm -hmm. and I asked him to do the cartoons for the Harvard Combined Charities Drive, of which I was director. And uh, he very kindly agreed to do it. And what we did was uh, support a number of charities through this single drive. Mm -hmm. I decided where the money went. <laughs> and... Uh, the theme was Once and for All, and Daisy May was our heroine. Wow. And he did a whole bunch of Daisy May cartoons for us. And actually, uh, that was how I became president of student council. I had a political organization in every one of the hundred or so entries on the Harvard campus. Uh, and every night they reported to me about how much money they had collected, what they had done, and so forth. And all of it was facilitated by Al Cap who was a terrific guy. He was so kind to me. He was so good. And I remember going to his studio, and there were, what, 20 people on the drawing boards mm -hmm. working with him. But he started out as a leftist, and he right. became a strong anti-communist conservative. In fact, at one point there was talk of trying to get him to run against Teddy Kennedy and yeah. so forth. And uh, Yeah, actually, I, um, you know, a lot of times when you have uh, uh, conservatives trying to do something liberals do, uh, particularly in the humor field, uh, they're, they're coming in and they're, they're just sort of copying what the other, other side is doing. Uh, in my case, I have a long, a lifelong interest in, in, in comics. Uh, I've, been, I've been collecting uh, comic strips, comic books, uh, going back to, uh, gosh, nearly 45 years. Do you remember now. Oswald the Rabbit? Uh, yes, absolutely, yes. And Where did he go? <laughs> well, actually, uh, it, I'm, 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 I'm pulling out the memory, but as I recall, it was uh, it was an ownership thing regarding Disney and so forth. That, I uh, preferred Oswald. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he was better than Bugs Bunny. I guess the, Disney was doing him, and then when he left, he had to create his own character, and uh, that's where uh, Mickey Mouse came from. But uh, uh, I actually have gone back over the year. I did this when I was a kid, uh, and I read every little Abner from the first one. I read every... Pogo from the first one, uh, all the, you know, Dick Tracy and, and Alley Oop and every one. Alley Oop uh, was a great one. Yeah. And uh, so I come to this with a love of cartooning. Remember and I, the schmooze? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, the, see, that's the thing, because Cap was so great at creating these satirical characters. And, uh, in fact, the first movie that I can actually date when I saw it, I was not quite three years old, and I saw the movie version of Little Abner, the musical, which is I just recently saw again, and the uh, it very very funny, and it uh, is, uh, one of my daughters starred in a production of Little Abner at Shenandoah College okay. in Virginia, and uh, and I remember seeing the show uh, in Boston before it went to Broadway, mm -hmm. uh, and it was it was a ter terrific show, great music. Jubilation T. Cornpone. Exactly. And all of it was Stubby K and all of that. Right. Great. And, and, and the thing uh, is that uh, 
you know, I, my love of this field led to where we are today. And I, and I need to mention that I, I work because I, I sort of I fell out of drawing myself after college. And I can still draw, but not fast enough. And so there's a fellow named Kevin Tuma, who is the artist that I work with. And, uh, you know, he's half of the credit for everything. And I, I, I say that right out there. And he has drawn for everything from the American Conservative to the Cato Institute, CNS News. And he's also done regular comic book work like the Green Hornet and the Twilight Zone. So uh, he's a professional. And, you know, our intent was this thing is going to be 100% professional. This is not some, you know, ghettoized conservative ripoff of something. This is a, a, a fully realized Steve, universe. Steve, we have to take thinking. a break. More from Steve Allen. Not to be confused with the fellow from The Tonight Show, who did some good work as well. And we're going to learn about another side of Steve Allen when we come back. The whole area of biodefense and his access to secret documents as a result of some of the work that he did there. Stay with us. Our guest is Steve Allen, of whom you're going to be hearing much more in the years to come. You are a defender of liberty. You spoke out. You were heard in Congress. No. You marched. You created a new movement. You endured attacks. You see folks waving tea bags around. Now you can help to repeal the bill. Go to sendthemamessage.com. Print the pledge to repeal Obamacare. Send it to your representative, senators, and candidates to sign that they pledge to repeal the bill. 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 Now. Go to sendthemamessage.com and help. Repeal the bill. Welcome back. I'm Howard Phillips of the Conservative Caucus with our special guest, Steve Allen. Steve, you had a life before cartooning. Uh, you did many things in politics. You were state youth chairman for Ronald Reagan in 1976, and uh, you, you did uh, many things in the uh, political world. And one of the things I find particularly interesting is your work in the field of biodefense. You, you have a Ph.D. in that PhD, field. Right. What is biodefense? Biodefense is the area where um, it brings together two different two different areas of study. Um, on the one hand, you have uh, public health, you have microbiology, biochemistry, epidemiology, and on the other hand, you have national security and homeland security. And biodefense is the, the, the area in between that brings both of those together. And uh, what happened was uh, there was a program at George Mason University uh, that was started up after the, um, particularly the anthrax letters attack in 9-11. Uh, because, uh, as we all know, uh, al-Qaeda has uh, put a high priority in obtaining biological weapons. And uh, uh, biodefense is, is one of the aspects of biodefense is defense against biological weapons. And the program, my mentor, was actually uh, a guy named Ken Alabeck who ran the Soviet biological weapons program and then defected to our side. You could not have had a better mentor. Absolutely. And... Uh, so, uh, and then in the national security area, I should mention, uh, uh, my mentor was uh, Peter Leitner, who's the fellow who went on 60 Minutes to blow the whistle on the Clintons selling missile technology to the uh, Red Chinese. What was the book that he wrote, Peter uh, Well, he's written about the, the Law of the Sea Treaty yeah. and various other. He's probably the top expert on the Law of the Sea yeah. Treaty. And uh, his, he's an expert witness on cases involving um, the re terrorist recruitment in prisons, which, of course, is a big deal right now just because of the recent... Uh, arrest of some men who got into uh, into the terrorism uh, as a result of being recruited in prison, uh, so uh, in U.S. prisons. So um, in biodefense, we are, we're, we're, you know, it, it can extend everything involving uh, pandemics, uh, the recent uh, concern over swine flu and so forth, uh, but 
in particular, we, uh, we look at biological weapons issues as well. Well, President Nixon killed our biodefense program. Yes. How did that happen? Well, he killed the biological weapons program. The theory was that we could still defend ourselves, uh, even if we didn't have a, a biological weapons program. So, and in other words, his, he said, let's do defense, but not offense. Defense, but not offense. Well, the problem is, of <clears> course, <throat> that, you know, you, you, it would be like... Uh, saying we're getting rid of all the government computers uh, in 1969, uh, but we'll still keep track of what the potential threat is from computers, even though we don't have any. Uh, and the, 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 the getting rid of the biological weapons program on the part of the U.S. was predicated on uh, Nixon being assured by every expert in the field uh, that the Soviets uh, would never pursue a biological weapons program because, uh, first of all, biological weapons didn't work. And secondly, the only reason they had them was because of the arms race and the idea that, well, the U.S. had them, so they had to have them too. Now, that's, of course, total nonsense. First of all, they do work. Secondly, the idea of an arms race, as you know, is, is, is ridiculous. If by arms race you mean the only reason they build weapons is because we have them, and if we'll stop, they'll stop. That was never true. And Nixon basically got snookered. Who did the snookering? It was, um, it was a process that goes back, actually, in my dissertation, um, 149,000 words and 1,011 footnotes, because I had to prove all this, uh, started in the 1930s when there was a concerted effort by the Soviets and their friends to take over all the scientific organizations. So that by the time 1968, 1969 rolls around, uh, at least left-wingers, if not outright uh, Marxists, controlled uh, the, the political programs of, of all the major scientific organizations. And, and then you had Henry Kissinger in there who, uh, you know, it was an interesting experience for me because I was able to read all the transcripts of his phone calls during this period and really got into it. How did head. you get access to those? Um, they were available at the National Archive, but they had just been completed. And so I was possibly the first researcher to actually see this particular set, which was the transcripts from 68, 69, or, or from 69, rather, and 70 during that period, the early time in the Nixon administration. Um, and uh, many things that people think to be true about biological weapons, uh, including the process Kissinger went through, who talked to him, things like that, that you see in PBS specials, you see in specials on the History Channel, they're just not true. And I, I was able to determine that through the, the course of reading these, uh, these transcripts, which weren't even indexed. So I had to read all of them, even the ones that didn't have anything to do with my, uh, my area of interest, because there was no index to them. What conclusions did you reach about uh, Dr. Kissinger? Uh, you know, one of the things that interested me when I first got into national politics, you mentioned that I was youth chairman in the Reagan campaign in 76, and I was delegate for Reagan then. I was press secretary in the 1980 campaign, and uh, I was delegate all three times Reagan ran. And uh, But one of the things that a animated us was Kissinger. Uh, if you recall... I led the fight against Kissinger at the 1980 Republican Convention, and I think I had a lot to do with uh, President Reagan's decision not to include him in the administration. You may recall that it was Senator McClure of Idaho who introduced Kissinger to the convention, mm -hmm. And I spent a lot of time trying to persuade McClure, who was a friend of mine, not to introduce him. And uh, he said, well, I've got to do it, but I'll cut the praise. <laughs> but uh, in any event, we really hammered Kissinger at that convention. Well, uh, the thing that I discovered was that uh, uh, as bad as conservatives thought Kissinger was, he was actually worse. Yeah. So uh, then, you know, that, then there's nothing like actually reading all these transcripts. Steve, I was in the Soviet Union in 1975. And I spent some time with Richard Combs, who was the chief of mission uh, at the U.S. Embassy in Moscow. And I said, why is Kissinger making all of these concessions to the Soviets? Uh, why uh, does he uh, feel that uh, these need to be made? And Combs said, well, Dr. Kissinger believes that the correlation of forces is more favorable to the United States today than it will ever again be and uh, we've got to strike a deal while we can. Exactly. As if the Soviets had departed from Lenin's uh, assertion that Peter treaties are like pie crusts made to be broken. And, 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 and worse than that was that the CIA estimates of Soviet strength were based on the idea that a planned centralized economy is far more efficient 
than a chaotic free market economy, and therefore the Soviets were going to surpass U the U.S. in industrial production uh, by the 1980s or the 1990s at the latest, and that was the CIA projection. So you know, if you believe that, then I guess you do believe we have to cut a deal with the Soviets. While How we long have you been out of that field of biodefense? Uh, never really left it. I've just I've been doing other things as well. I'm sort of a policy analyst. I do, do all sorts of different things. Sometimes I do biodefense. Sometimes I do other things. Can you fit any of this into your cartoons? Oh, uh, everything that I've worked on fits into the cartoons. You know, back in the uh, back in the 90s, I was writing about how things like the government guaranteeing pensions, the government guaranteeing mortgages, the government guaranteeing student loans was going to bring about disaster and political manipulation because there were people like Jesse Jackson that wanted to get their hands on this money and manipulate it in certain ways to, to benefit their political causes. All, Barney Frank, people like that. All of that happened, and then we saw the result. So, so everything, uh, you know, from... Uh, uh, that I've, I've learned in all those years working for, I, I was press secretary for Senator Jeremiah Denton from Alabama, um, so I know a lot about the way Congress works and the congressional staffs work. Everything goes into struggle. Have you had any recent contact with Senator Denton? Uh, not directly. Uh, I were actually, interestingly enough, I, I recently uh, contacted a couple of the old staffers and we're trying to sort of get a reunion together. But it's been a, it's been a few years because he retired. And Jerry Denton was a, a, a great man. And uh, he helped me on legislation to defund the left. It was extremely helpful and supportive. It was a tragedy that uh, he did not get the kind of support he merited, and he was succeeded by Senator Dick Shelby, mm -hmm. who has that seat now, former Democrat. Right. We have to take another break, Steve. And when we come back, we'll have some final words from you. And I'm going to ask you to give our audience information about how they could get your cartoon series published in their local newspaper and, uh, and how they can have access to it through the Internet, etc. Please stay with us. We'll be back right after these brief messages. Hey, listen. This is the greatest thing. I want to tell you something. Something's happening in this country. And I want to tell you, look, at, look around my friends here. My friends here in Washington, come over here. See all these great people? <laughs> these great folks are here because they want to take the country back to the direction of the Founding Fathers and stop all this nonsense that's going on and stop this, uh, you know, this uh, immersion into socialism which is happening. We've got to stop it. And every day we're losing a little bit of our freedom. But the, the answer is that the, the, that the individual citizens can make a difference. They can walk through these houses of Congress. They can look, at, look their congressman in the eye and say, hey, vote this bill down. Get rid of it. We've got a lot of work to do. And the, the first thing we have to do is get rid of the garbage and the attacks on our freedoms. This is it. So anyway, that's what these guys are doing here today to do. Yes! That's what they're doing. And, uh, and I say, all of you guys out there, where it was the sound of my voice and the, and the you know, the visual that you're cre that this great gentleman has created, get down here and do your do your uh, responsible citizenship by going and seeing your representatives and telling them, you know, what you want because this is this is your house. It's not their house. Yeah. Get in there and tell them what to do, and let's uh, let's begin. Cleaning this country up is a, a big yes. mess has been created in only a year's time, in nine months' time, really. A big mess we have to recover from. We've got to start work. We've got to throw some people out. So anyway, I love this country. I love you. Go do your job. Thank you. Welcome back. I'm Howard Phillips, chairman of the Conservative Caucus, which sponsors Conservative Roundtable. If you're interested in the kinds of issues we discuss on Conservative Roundtable, please check out our website, conservativeusa.org. Uh, if you'd like to receive, with no cost or obligation, some of our literature, uh, fax me your name and address and contact information. Our fax number is 
281-4108, or you can snail mail me a letter at 450 Maple Avenue East, Vienna, Virginia, 22180. Steve, this has been a great discussion. I, I'm very hopeful about your cartoon series. I'm sure the viewers would be interested in knowing how they can see your cartoons mm -hmm. and what they can do to get them published in their local area. Okay. Well, as far as seeing them, it's very easy. Um, the uh, comics appear on the Conservative HQ website, so it's Conservative HQ, like headquarters, conservativehq.com, and then you can do slash lick skillet if you want the, to go directly to the comic. Uh, or you can just Google... Spell lick skillet. L-I-C-K-S-K-I-L-L-E-T. Good. And um, or you can just uh, you can Google the, the gentleman from Lick, Lick Skillet, which is the title of the comic, and, and it'll it'll pop up. Uh, and then the way that you can help out uh, with uh, getting it in newspapers, and that's what we really want to do, uh, is first of all you, know, you can contact your your uh, local newspaper, but mainly uh, I think it's good to get in touch with us. We're going to be starting a, a, a place on Facebook. And how do and people that, that get in touch with you? Uh, best way is the uh, is the email, which is editor, like editor, E-D-I-T-O-R, at lickskillet, L-I-C-K-S-K-I-L-L-E-T, dot org, and it's dot org, O-R-G. Uh, and if they, uh, if they will send me an email, we'll get them on the list. Uh, we're trying to start basically a fan club on Facebook to put pressure. You know, it's a tough time because even the Washington Post has, uh, to give one example, has cut the number of comics pages from three to two recently. And obviously, as a conservative strip, we're, we have extra burdens that others don't have. But, uh, but I think it, uh, this, our strip is unique, and it's something people Steve, we have to stop here. You've been a great guest. Thank, Thank you for you. joining us on Conservative Roundtable. And check out Steve Allen's comic strips and his other work as well. We hope you'll uh, stay with us and join us for our next broadcast of Conservative Roundtable.